Season two of Michigan Podcast is underway with part one of our 2018 college football preview next. But there's going to be one team that's going to play solely as a team. No man is more important than the team. No coach is more important than the team. The team, the team, the team. Let's see for Anthony Wait for it. Yep. This is no time for that. In the pocket and a sack. Tim Jamison. Brady gets terrific. Throws it and a touchdown night again. Schultz just before Brazil got him. And a leaping interception by Woodson. Harbaugh back to throw over the middle. Caught by Kohler at the five on his feet. Touchdown, Michigan. He's 5'7", 179 pounds, a junior at Michigan. But Jamie Morris packs a wallop, and he delivers for Bo Schindler. And here's your first play. Pressure coming. Sack. It is Glenn Steele, number 81, who fought his way through the traffic. Option. And Robinson calls his own number, and he's going to score. Oh, an easy touchdown for Ron Robinson and Michigan. Win it. We're going to win the championship again because we're going to play as a team. And when we play as a team, and the old season is over, you and I know it's going to be Michigan again. Michigan. Go Blue and greetings and welcome to Season 2 of Michigan Podcast. I'm Steve Dace. Our long national nightmare is almost over. That's right. We are just days away from the Maize and Blue and several other of the big-time college football programs reporting for fall camp. We are just weeks away from the 2018 college football season. It's the most wonderful time of the year and what better way to start off by taking a look at what we think is going to happen this season that's right let's just spoil the whole thing right now of course we'll be lucky if like 20 percent of what you're going to see in our first two episodes this season actually comes true but it's going to be fun watching the season play out to find out which 20% it is. We begin our college football preview with what I like to call the crystal ball, predicting the top 25 things we think are going to occur between right now and when the 2018 season wraps up with the national championship game. Number one, for the first time, a two-loss team will make the college football playoff. Now, remember, last year, two two-loss teams almost made the playoff. Auburn was number two heading into the final week of ratings in the college football playoff rankings, but then lost in the SEC championship game to Georgia. Ohio State, after winning the Big Ten championship with two losses, many thought they were a lock to get in the playoff. The committee had other ideas and put Alabama in instead. But... We're going to see, I think, a two-loss team, mainly because I don't see anybody getting out of the Big Ten with fewer than two losses, and we'll have more on that in Episode 2 when we have our Top 25 rankings, which are a projection of how we think the season will end, as well as our conference predictions. Number two, no FBS team. That's football bowl subdivision. No FBS team will finish undefeated this season. No one in the Power Five, No one in the group of five. I think everybody has at least one loss. Number three, Ohio University. Give it up for the Bobcats. 
They will end one of the nation's longest championship droughts. Only Iowa State, Vanderbilt, Indiana, and Minnesota's are longer. They're going to win their first conference title since 1968 for Frank Solich. Number four, Brian Kelly is heading into his ninth year at Notre Dame. Since Newt Rockney, only three other coaches have lasted that long in South Bend. They were pretty good. Frank Leahy, Eric Parsegian, and Lou Holtz. They all won national championships, which Kelly has not. And look at their win percentages compared to Kelly's. 818 compared to 670. Given that trend line, I believe this will be Brian Kelly's final season at Notre Dame before he heads off to the NFL. And I'm going to predict he's replaced by Iowa State football coach Matt Campbell, whose personality couldn't be any different than Brian Kelly's, which is one of the reasons why I think he'll be high on their list. Number five, this will be Bill Snyder's final season as a college football coach, but he will wait until well after the bowl game to announce it in an effort to force the school to name his son as a successor. This has been one of the -the under-the-radar controversies in college football. Uh, A lot of talk down in uh, the Little Apple that Bill Snyder has stayed on for a couple more years, even with uh, some medical conditions, mainly because he's trying to pressure the school into naming his son as his successor, and the school is resisting that. Number six, after losing four games in a season only once between 1969 and 2001, Nebraska will lose at least four games for the 15th straight season. That's incredible that that's happened in Nebraska. And even though I think Scott Frost will definitely turn it around there, I don't think it will happen right away. Number seven, for the first time in 15 years, the Miami Hurricanes will finish with double-digit regular season wins for the second consecutive season. Man, if you're my age and you grew up in the era of the U where multiple coaches, from Howard Schnellenberger to Jimmy Johnson, yes, that Jimmy Johnson, uh, to Dennis Erickson, to uh, to Larry Coker, four different coaches at Miami won national championships in less than 20 years. It's hard to believe that it's been 15 years since Miami has had back-to-back double-digit wins in the regular season. I think they snapped that streak with Mark Richt this year. Number eight, either Art Bryles or Hugh Freeze will be hired as FBS head coaches in 2019. Now, I I don't think they'll be hired in the Power Five, but I think someone somewhere in the group of five is going to give one of these guys a shot. I am not morally endorsing it. I'm just saying in an era where Bobby Petrino can cheat on his wife, cheat on his school, then bolt on his pro football team, And then turn around and get another Power 5 job right away where Rick Pitino can claim he didn't know that he was running an on-campus brothel or at least one of his uh, glorified grad assistants was on campus to uh, procure players. That is the era in which we are in. So, again, I'm not morally uh, supporting it. I'm just saying it is what it is. Number nine. After another disappointing season, Colorado will fire Mike McIntyre and replace him with Florida Atlantic coach Lane Kiffin. Could you imagine Joey Freshwater in the state of legalized chronic? The headlines just write themselves. Number 10. Jalen Hurts will remain at Alabama through the season, getting his degree in December, and then he's going to leave afterwards as an immediately eligible grad transfer. So while I think Tua Tonga-Vailoa will beat him out for the starting quarterback job at Alabama in this year's camp, I think he won't transfer with the new transfer rules and the redshirt rules. Remember, Jalen Hurts played as a true freshman. So he has still not used his redshirt year. He could play in four games for Alabama this year. Uh, You know, games where they figure to dominate, roll up some nice stats, use a redshirt, and still be good to go for another team. And with the new transfer rules, he can also go anywhere he wants in the SEC right away for next season. Number 11, North Carolina will fire Larry Fedora after the season, and they will replace him with the mullet. Oklahoma State coach Mike Gundy. And you look at Oklahoma State football, with with the exception of when they had 
who was that one Washington Redskin guy from back in the day who was an all-pro on their Super Bowl teams and her Joe Gibbs, but then talked, Dexter Manley, that's right, talked about how he got a degree from Oklahoma State and he couldn't read. Well, with the exception of that era, like Oklahoma State football hasn't done anything that Mike Gundy either wasn't their starting quarterback, their offensive coordinator, or their head coach. And yet, he's got T. Boone Pickens all up in his business. He's got his AD trashing his recruiting, coming off of four 10-win seasons in five years at Oklahoma State, man. You ever been to Stillwater? I was just there a few weeks ago. It's a nice place. But there are more high school football players that you would want to recruit standing around the outside of my Iowa studio than there are in Stillwater, Oklahoma, okay? And you're getting 10 wins four times in five years? Come on, man. So I I could see Mike Gundy saying, you know what, man? Screw that noise. I'm going to a state where there's a lot more talent to a division where I can be instantly competitive and the expectations, they understand who they are when apparently some folks at Oklahoma State are having delusions of grandeur. Number 12, Memphis coach Mike Norvell will get a Big 12 head coaching job either at Oklahoma State or Texas Tech where his offense will fit right into the league and also to those two offensively driven programs. Number 13, Herm Edwards is only going to last one season at Arizona State, guys. I I just don't. I don't see this working. I I see this as a great big flame out. It reminds me of when Howard Schnellenberger came out of retirement to coach Oklahoma for like a week a few years ago and the disaster that was. Yeah, I just, yeah, I don't, I don't think this is going to work. Number 14, Jim Harbaugh will get his first win over Urban Meyer on November the 24th. Please. Please, Joe Boo. Please. I can't. I'm freaking tired of losing to those guys. Please. Just make it stop. Number 15, LSU will upset Alabama on November the 3rd at home, handing the Crimson Tide their only loss of the season and buying Ed Orgeron another year in Baton Rouge. Number 16, the Heisman Trophy finalist will be in alphabetical order. Bryce Love at Stanford, Trace McSorley at Penn State, DeAndre Swift at Georgia, and Jonathan Taylor at Wisconsin. Number 17, this will be the year of the running back. As for the first time in college football history, more than two FBS tailbacks will rush for 2,000 yards in the same season. We've seen two tailbacks do it several times in recent years, but I, I, think, I think it's possible. When you look at Derek Singletary at, uh, at Florida Atlantic, uh, when you look at Juwan Johnson at San Diego State, you look at Jonathan Taylor, you look at Bryce Love, um, I, I think it's possible we could see four, maybe five tailbacks rush for 2,000 yards, counting bowl game stats when this season is over. Number 18, six of the last nine Heisman Trophy winners were 25 to one or worse in Vegas to win in the preseason. So I'm going out on a limb with that trend. I'm predicting DeAndre Swift of Georgia will be the dog's first Heisman Trophy winner since Herschel Walker and continue that trend of off-the-radar guys in the preseason capturing the award. Now, here's why I like DeAndre Swift. He was simply electric uh, in fill-in duty for Nick Chubb and Sonny Michelle last year. He is the clear number one tailback for Georgia this year. They brought in who some people thought is the top prep running back in the country, but he's coming off an ACL. He's also going to be, so that means Swift's going to get a lot of carries. He's also going to be running behind what I think is the best offensive line coming back in the SEC. And when you look at that schedule for Georgia, and and I'm not going to knock them because, you know, a lot of years, Georgia's one of the few teams in the SEC and really in the country that play two power five non-conference opponents uh, every year. I mean, they just did it last year with Notre Dame and Georgia Tech. Now, this year, they're not. This is the softest schedule that Georgia's probably played in in decades, but I'm going to give them a break because they usually play one of the tougher schedules. But that soft schedule also means huge numbers for DeAndre Swift. So I'm going to predict DeAndre Swift is the latest off-the-radar guy, like Robert Griffin III was, like Baker Mayfield was when he was a Heisman Trophy finalist back in 2015, like Lamar Jackson was when he was 100-1 to 1 
in the preseason to win the Heisman Trophy. I'm going to predict DeAndre Swift of Georgia brings the Heisman down between the hedges. 19. Almost half of the top 25 teams in the college football playoff rankings at the end of the regular season are going to be from just two conferences, the Big Ten and the SEC. I think those two leagues are that far apart from everybody else. Number 20. Here's what I think will be the results of the top five early non-conference games in 2018. I like Washington over Auburn. Here you have two evenly matched teams. It will feel like a home game for Auburn. However, the Huskies, I think, are going to pull off a mild upset with Auburn breaking in four new starters on the offensive line. I think if this game were played week three, week four, I think the overall athleticism for Auburn would be too much for Washington. But week one, four new starters on the offensive line. I think Chris Peterson, with a, this, the, maybe the best defense in the Pac-12, which kind of sounds like faint praise, but no, they really do play defense at Washington. I think they win that game against Auburn in week one. I like Michigan over Notre Dame. And this reminds me a lot of Michigan's opener against Florida last year, where both teams have major question marks offensively, but you knew going into the game the best unit on the field was going to be Don Brown's defense. And I think you will see that in South Bend on prime time, in prime time, on opening weekend. I think Shea Patterson will be a little rusty, but will do just enough to get Michigan just enough points to win this game, probably something like 24-17, 27-20, something like that. But the story of the game will be the Michigan defense, particularly against a Notre Dame offensive line, replacing two top 10 draft picks. I like Miami over LSU. Now, the talent here is pretty even overall, but I think it's a major coaching match for the Hurricanes, Mark Richt against Ed Orgeron, especially in a season opener with so much time to prepare. And I also think Miami's going to come in pretty hungry after the way they finished last season on a disappointing note. And LSU breaking in a new quarterback in Joe Burrows, who's never really played any meaningful college football before. Clemson over Texas A&M. Now, Kyle Field is no joke. And let's face it, Jimbo Fisher's used to taking on Dabo Swinney. But the big story here for me is who's the quarterback for Clemson in this game? If you go back to 2013, Dabo Swinney has often said his greatest coaching regret is that he didn't start freshman Deshaun Watson on the road against Georgia, and they lost that game. So will they start Trevor Lawrence, the much-hyped freshman, Will they put him up against 100,000 Giga Maggies at Kyle Field in that environment? I think that'll be a, a fascinating coaching subplot to that game. And then finally, I like Texas over USC. Now, this game last year at the LA Coliseum might have been the best non-conference game in, of the season. Uh, I don't know that it'll be that much of a classic, but I think Texas at home against an USC team that might be coming in starting a guy who, in JT Daniels who should be a high school senior at quarterback. I like Texas to get revenge for last year's heartbreaking loss. Number 21. Central Florida, Virginia Tech, and LSU will begin the season ranked in the top 25, but they will not finish there. Number 22, Florida, Florida Atlantic, and Iowa won't be ranked in the preseason top 25, but they will finish there at the end of the regular season. Number 23, the following first-year coaches are going to lead their teams to bowl games as rookies. Mario Cristobal at Oregon, they have a Charmin soft schedule. Jimbo Fisher at Texas A&M, Scott Frost at Nebraska. I don't think they'll win a bunch of games, but enough to get to a bowl. Josh Heupel at Central Florida, Chip Kelly at UCLA, Joe Moorhead at Mississippi State, Dan Mullen at Florida, Kevin Sumlin at Arizona, and Willie Taggart, the former Jim Harbaugh protege at Florida State. Number 24, liquidate on these teams that will win at least two fewer games than they did last season. All right, so these are teams that are going to win at least two fewer games in 2018 than they did in 2017. In alphabetical order, Arizona State, Army, Central Florida, Central Michigan, Northwestern, Oklahoma State, South Florida, TCU, Toledo, USC, Virginia Tech, 
and Washington State. I think those teams all are going to win at least two fewer games than they did last year. On the other hand, invest in these teams that I think will win at least two more games than they won last season. Again, in alphabetical order, Baylor, BYU, Georgia Tech, Florida, Florida State, Maryland, Michigan, Nebraska, Pittsburgh, and Texas. We'll continue our 2018 college football preview in a moment. Back here on the season premiere of season two of Michigan Podcast, I'm Steve Dace, Go Blue, as we continue part one of our 2018 college football preview. Well, as I start projecting how I think the season's going to go, one of the things I've put more emphasis on in recent years in my college football previews are how I rank the coaches. Because coaching is a huge factor in terms of the trend line for recruiting, development, game day decisions, big game coaches, et cetera. So this year I put more effort into my coaching rankings than I ever have before, and I used the following formula. A total of 31 points is possible to rank each coach. Each coach was given points on a scale of one to 10, one being the fewest, 10 being the most, of course, on their Power 5 coaching record and resume alone as a head coach. Then they were given points on a scale of 1 to 5 on their non-Power 5 coaching record or resume alone, meaning what they may have done as a coordinator, uh, what they may have done in the NFL, etc. Then they were given a point total of 1 to 10, again, 1 being the, the worst, 10 being the highest, on their current coaching trajectory, meaning what's the trend line of their program in the next three years? What's their current trajectory? And then you were given up to three bonus points, so anywhere from one to three bonus points, depending on your record as a big game coach. And then finally, if right now, based on your resume, if nothing else changed about your resume, you would be a college football Hall of Fame coach. You were awarded three bonus points. So that's where the total of 31 points in ranking the coaches comes from. Now, here's how that point total came out. And if we had a tie, ties were determined by the current coaching trajectory, meaning if you scored higher than the coach you were tied with on the current coaching trajectory, you got the tiebreaker. If you were still tied after that, then I made the call. So we had some human error. Here's this year's coaching rankings of the Power Five, one through 65. I don't think you'll be surprised by the top three at all, and Nick Saban, Urban Meyer, and Dabo Swinney. Um, Chris Peterson and Chip Kelly Round out the top five. Mark D'Antonio of Michigan State is at number six. Jimbo Fisher, now of Texas A&M. Gary Patterson of TCU. Mark Richt at Miami. And Bill Snyder at Kansas State with one of the most underrated coaching jobs of all time in the history of this sport. They round out your top ten. When you look at the next ten, First up, a familiar face to we Michigan fans. Jim Harbaugh is at number 11, followed by his protege, David Shaw at Stanford, Brian Kelly at Notre Dame, Kirby Smart at Georgia, Dan Mullen at Florida, Gus Malzahn, Kyle Whittingham at Utah, Mike Gundy at Oklahoma State, Paul Johnson at Georgia Tech. I was shocked how high he scored on this, but the numbers are what they are. And James Franklin at Penn State. Those round out the top 20 coaches. As we continue through the list, you'll see more names, particularly names uh, associated with the Big Ten. Kirk Ferentz at Iowa at number 21. Paul Christ at Wisconsin at number 25. Jeff Brom at Purdue at number 28. Pat Fitzgerald. Just I was shocked at how high Paul Johnson was. See, I'm a Pat Fitzgerald slappy. I'd have figured he was not this low. I would have put him higher, just eyeballing it. But he was at number 31 on this list. As we continue, Scott Frost at Nebraska at number 35. But I have to think if we keep doing this another few years, two or three years from now, he's going to be a lot higher on this list. P.J. Fleck at Minnesota at number 44. And when we get down to the very bottom, Tom Allen at Indiana, number 61. Lovey Smith at Illinois at number 58. Amongst the lowest rated coaches right now in the Power Five college football heading into 2018. 
back one final time on Michigan Podcast, and we conclude our season premiere for Season 2 and Part 1 of our 2018 College Football Preview with a new metric that I introduced last year. In fact, this metric, if you go back, this was our pilot episode last year here on Michigan Podcast. And I wanted to see, could you come up with something, uh, an analytic, that would define how much depth a team has and what their ceiling with their overall scholarship personnel might be. Because the old days when we just looked at returning starters, you know, there's so many sub packages now. So many of the top recruiting programs are losing so many guys early to the NFL and playing young guys uh, that, you know, you didn't know a lot about heading into last season. I mean, I look at our team, Michigan. Devin Bush is a consensus preseason All-American. Other than Michigan fans, nobody was talking about him at this time last year because he wasn't a returning starter. Rashawn Gary wasn't a returning starter. Okay, Chase Winovich, who led the Big Ten in tackles for losses. Kalik Hudson, who was a back, who I think was second uh, in in the Big Ten in tackles for losses, not returning starters. You know, it almost doesn't matter how many returning starters Alabama and Ohio State and Clemson have every year with the way they've shown they can replenish talent, right? So is there a metric and an analytic we could develop that goes into a little bit more detail? And if you go back and looked at last year's preview episode, our very first debut, remember how high Georgia scored on our talent roster evaluation? They had the number two roster, man, one to 85 in college football. And, you know, they were coming off a year that they went seven and five in the regular season. Well, that metric turned out to be right because Georgia – was a, was one overtime away from winning the national championship last season. So I tinkered with it a little bit for 2018. I updated it a little bit. And here's how we're measuring roster talent this season. Just as we did last year, we're going to primarily use the 24-7 Sports Composite Recruiting Rankings as our main data point. All right, so we're going to look at the last four recruiting classes for every Power 5 team. That's 2015 through 2018. And if you signed a five-star, you were given five points, four points for a four-star, three points for a three-star, and I didn't award any points for anybody below that. I also did my best with the most updated information out there to account for player attrition, meaning guys that left early for the NFL or guys that were kicked out of school, et cetera. Uh, We also factored in what the recruiting rankings of incoming transfers were. Just as we also deducted points, of the recruiting rankings of outgoing transfers. Now, if you brought in a fifth-year graduate transfer, you were given a minimum of three points for that player because you have to think with five years of development, he's at least worthy of a three-star recruiting ranking. If you kept fifth-year seniors, we didn't count them unless they figured prominently on the depth chart. There aren't too many schools left in America that play a lot of fifth-year seniors. Stanford would be one, but the fifth-year senior with the advent of early entries in the NFL draft is increasingly becoming an endangered species in college football, right? So usually if you're a fifth-year senior in college football, sometimes there's a Chase Winovich. But most of the time, if you're still out of school, chances are you're transferring to another school where you have a chance to play because you've been passed up on the depth chart. And then finally, if players had clearly overplayed their recruiting rankings, like I can think of several players on Wisconsin's offensive line, for example, if, if, he had, if, if a player clearly has outplayed what his composite recruiting ranking was, I gave him a bonus point for that as well. Now, the scores you're about to see are updated with the best information available through July 1. So any attrition that took place after that is not factored in to this talent evaluation. Let's start with the ACC. And when you see the point total in the ACC, you might be surprised that Clemson isn't much more ahead. But one of the things people don't realize about Clemson, they sign a lot of three-star prospects. I mean, you go back to their 2014 class, and uh, that was the Deshaun Watson class. They signed nine three-star prospects in that class. So what Clemson does a phenomenal job of is finding underdeveloped but highly athletic three-star guys and developing them into elite-level college football players. Plus, Clemson lost four of its top seven prospects early to the NFL from the 2015 class. Florida State's roster, 
Willie Taggart inherits a roster that is still plenty talented. The majority of Miami's talent points comes from its two most recent classes. So the Hurricanes are trending up, and they're not going anywhere in the next couple of years. North Carolina's highest class was its most recent one, so I think they're in for another rebuilding year. Only 7% of Pittsburgh's roster points come from its senior class. That was the lowest of any school in the Power Five. And Louisville could be in for a fall this fall when you look at where their overall roster ranks. And Boston College, I mean, they clearly played over their talent level last season. Now we move on to the Big 12. Now this league's overall scores are held down because of its over-reliance on two-year junior college players. No other Power 5 conference signs more JUCOs. So player retention, which is a key metric here, is, is a weakness for the Big 12. So that's why their scores seem lower than the other leagues. A pair of the offseason's most coveted grad transfers helped give Texas, which also has three straight or three top 10 classes in the last four years, easily the league's most talented roster. In fact, Texas looks a lot like Georgia did last year in, for Kirby Smart's second season. You know, uh, Texas was six and six for Tom Herman in year one. Georgia was seven and five for Kirby Smart. But the metrics said that Kirby Smart was bringing back all kinds of untapped talent. And you saw his program take off in year two. This analytic says the same thing could happen for Texas this fall. There is a chasm, as you can see, a chasm between Texas, Oklahoma, and the rest of this conference. Three grad transfers bolstered West Virginia in to third place but it's not a strong third place. Coming off of three consecutive 10-win seasons, Oklahoma State looks like they are facing a bit of a rebuilding season in 2018. Not surprisingly, Baylor's strongest class was its most recent, which includes four top Power Five transfers who should provide immediate upgrades. And when you look at this, you can see why earlier I told you Bill Snyder has done one of the greatest coaching jobs in the history of college football. He just, he doesn't have the talent everybody else has, and yet he beats most of these teams anyway. And now the Big Ten. Ohio State just missed by one point having the most talented roster in the sport this season. Penn State's freshman class was easily its highest scoring so it's going to rely on several youngsters like Ricky Slade and Micah Parsons this fall. Now you contrast that with Michigan. Michigan's senior class, which was compiled late and on the fly when Harbaugh wasn't hired, I think, until December the 28th, uh, it's a major drag on Michigan's point total. It's one of the lowest scoring senior classes in the Power Five. Maryland's better than expected score is based on consecutive top 30 classes. No program in this conference, though, and few in the entire Power Five has been hit harder by attrition than Michigan State. It has lost the high end of its highly regarded 2016 class, and it's already lost top prospects from 2015 and 2017, too. So its starting lineup looks really good, but overall depth for Michigan State is not where it was at the height of the D'Antonio era. Pat Fitzgerald continues to do more with less as well as anybody in college football. Purdue's senior and junior classes combine to barely outscore Penn State's freshman class in talent. Let me repeat that. Purdue's junior and senior classes combined barely outscore in talent Penn State's incoming freshman class which speaks even more favorably to the job Jeff Brom did in his first year in West Lafayette. We now go to the Pac-12. Now, towards the top of the conference are a pair of teams in UCLA and Oregon with rosters that appear ready to win right away for their new coaches, Chip Kelly and Mario Cristobal. Now, Cristobal's got a lot friendlier schedule than Chip Kelly is playing, though. Keep that in mind. Stanford's score received the biggest boost in all of the Power Five from fifth-year seniors, which is probably no surprise, because as I said at the start of this, there aren't too many teams left that play a lot of fifth-year seniors. Washington's best two classes are its freshman and sophomore classes, so the Huskies are not going anywhere for the foreseeable future. Lowly Kansas is the only Power Five team with fewer combined roster points in its junior and senior classes than Colorado. Uh-oh. That is not a comparison you want. 
And you look at this league, you can see it is pretty balanced. When the most talented roster in USC has a gaping hole at quarterback, you can see the race in this league, it's pretty open. And finally, we look at the SEC. Thanks to the highest combined score from its freshman and sophomore classes in the Power Five, Georgia is now the overall most talented team in the country, barely. Alabama remains formidable, but the gutting of its 2015 class has allowed the rest of the SEC to close the gap here a little bit. Third place LSU and fourth place Auburn, they would each have the most talented rosters in three of the other Power Five leagues. Think about that for a second. If not for the addition of three top transfers adding to its score, though, LSU would have had its least talented roster in several years. Texas A&M fans should expect Jimbo Fisher to start earning his money right away, given the talent base that he inherits. And it's pretty obvious why Butch Jones was fired at Tennessee when you look at this, because a roster this talented should have won more games. And this all but confirms Drew Locke is a one-man show at Missouri because the Tigers do not have the overall personnel to compete in this conference. And then there's Vanderbilt in for a long year. So how do these teams look outside of their own conferences and up against one another? Here are the top 25 most talented rosters heading into the 2018 season. There you can see Georgia at number one, Ohio State and Alabama, those three schools separated by a total of five points. So it's very close. And that reinforces the public perception that Georgia has joined Alabama and Ohio State when it comes to the elite programs. The other elite team in that foursome is Clemson, but they are doing a much better job than Dabo Sweeney gets credit for at player development. Last year, as I said a few minutes ago, this model forecast Georgia to have a breakout season if it could find a quarterback, and it was right. This year, that team appears to be Texas. If it can get either Sam Ellinger or Shane Bouchelle to be the quarterback, the trigger man Tom Herman needs for that offense, then it is lined up to be this year's Georgia. And then after the top four, parity reigns. Teams five through 19, which includes our beloved Wolverines, they are separated by just a total of 32 points. Translation, coaching, and injuries are what's going to ultimately separate those programs on the field this fall. Which of those programs will have a coach on the hot seat in December and which of those programs will be a playoff contender in December instead? Now, here are your best bang for your buck programs. Programs that are getting the most return for what they bring in and what they have on their roster. I think Clemson is number one. I mean, they are competing with Alabama and Ohio State and they don't have the overall roster that those programs have. Northwestern, I would have at number two with Pat Fitzgerald, followed by Wisconsin, Kansas State, and then I'm going to cop out here because I couldn't couldn't make a decision, so I'm going to go with Michigan State and Boston College as a tie. Here are the programs doing the most with least. LSU is number one. I don't think that shocks anybody. Texas is next. Texas A&M, Tennessee, and UCLA. Uh, Those five schools have all made coaching changes in the last year and a half. And now we know why, (laughs) because their fans are right to be expecting more with what they have on campus. Well, that's going to do it for part one of our season preview for 2018. Part two, we're going to give you what I think will be the top 25 teams at the end of the year, who I think will be the four teams in the college football playoff, and what will be the final standings in all of the Power Five conferences. That and more coming up in part two of our 2018 preview. Want to thank all of you for tuning in. Make sure to follow us on Twitter at Michigan Podcast. Want to thank Detroit Sports Podcast, Michael Spat, the WTKA in Ann Arbor, and everybody else that helps us to get the word out about what we do each week right here at Michigan Podcast. Go Blue. Interception by Woodson. Harbaugh back to throw over the middle. Caught by Collins at the five on his feet. Touchdown, Michigan. On his way. It's good. He's 
5'7", 179 pounds, a junior at Michigan. But Jamie Morris packs a wallop, and he delivers for Bo Schimbeck. And here's your first play. Pressure coming, sack. It is Glenn Steele, number 81, who fought his way through the traffic. Option. And Robinson calls his own number, and he's going to score. Oh, an easy touchdown for Ron Robinson and Michigan. Winner. We're going to win the championship again because we're going to play as a team. And when we play as a team, and the old season is over, you and I know it's going to be Michigan again. Michigan.